All right, welcome back. So we stopped here uh, on our function slide. We learned how to make functions. We learned how to test them. Uh, and then we stopped on this thing called the stack that uh, is short for this term called the runtime stack. So let me write that out in full. It's really the uh, function call stack. Or alternatively, the runtime stack or call stack. Okay, so it has something to do. It's, it's like a, a, a diagram that we can draw that tells us how a function is executing. So it answers these kinds of questions like what is C++ actually doing when I call a function? How does it, how does it know? Like I called it in main, it needs to come back to main. How does it know where it left off and all that? So uh, that is exactly what the stack will tell us. So every time a function gets called, be it a library function, a function that you make, uh, it gets pushed onto this thing called the stack or the runtime stack or the function call stack. Okay? It's the place where functions uh, know where to return to. So they just look underneath them and they, they see which, which function called them. Okay? And the very key thing is that every function has its own memory for its local variables. Nobody else gets to touch them. So for example, let's say we have our main function. Boop. That's our main function. Maybe inside of the main function, uh, we call the foo function. These are just generic names uh, that computer scientists like to use. And then we define our foo function. And inside of that, we call a bar function. Dot, dot, dot. So we got a bunch of functions. Uh, and then bar. Who knows what it does, but maybe it just prints something out. Who knows? Boop, boop, boop. But the idea is, inside of main, main calls foo, foo calls bar, bar doesn't do too much. This is what this thing called the stack looks like. So down here, this is like the bottom of the stack. I'll just draw a line. And there's always one thing on the stack while your program is running, and it's the main function. The terminal, in essence, calls the main function. And as long as your program is running, the main function is waiting. It's either running inside of uh, the main function, it's executing lines of the main function, or it's execu executing lines that the main function has indirectly called through function calls. Okay? So you got main function, and maybe it has its local variable called x. And then main calls foo, uh, foo up here. And once main calls foo, another piece of information is added to this thing called the stack. It's another stack frame, we say. Uh, let's see if I can draw this in a different color. So there's a stack frame. Uh, that's a little too close. Stack frame. For each function, they get their own little stack frame, we say. And this is uh, foo's stack frame, and maybe it has a, f a variable inside of it called y. Holds 43, perhaps. It's like int y. Da, da, da. And then foo, of course, is going to call bar. And so then, while foo's waiting, we need to add another stack frame for bar. And so inside of our program, maybe bar has a variable called z. Inside of our program, we have three functions in essence, running at once. We have main waiting here for foo to return. We have foo waiting here for bar to return. And then bar is doing its work. All right? As soon as bar is finished, it will, of course, return something back. It will, what's called, uh, pop itself off the stack. And it'll go away. And then foo gets back to work. Because it was waiting. It's waiting right here. And then bar completed, so it can finally start doing work down here. And then once foo's done, it, it can return back to whoever called it, and main called it. Maybe they're returning values, who knows. And then we're suddenly back in main. Main is the only frame on the stack at this point, because it was waiting for foo to return. Foo did return, and now it can do the rest of its code. OK? So that, in a nutshell, is how functions work inside of C++. There's just It's a waiting game. Main calls somebody. We make a stack frame that holds its local variables, who calls something else, make a stack frame that holds its local variables, and as soon as things start returning, 
uh, they go off the stack. So really, I should be erasing these things. Uh, but I'm just keeping them here so you can see them when uh, you study. So that, in a very quick nutshell, is the stack. And I will give some more examples. And I did give you a sneak peek before this, didn't I? So while we're on the topic of variables and where they live, let's talk about global variables and just the lifetime of a variable. Now, this will definitely date me, but back uh, when I was a kid, everybody loved Harry Potter. I don't know if that's a thing anymore. Probably, maybe there are some of you who have never even seen the movies or read the books. But this is Harry Potter, and this is Cedric Diggory. And uh, in the movie, sadly, Cedric ends up dying. And Harry is, of course, the boy who lived, so he, he will live forever. So we're going to make Harry a global variable, and Cedric will be a local variable. All right, so... Uh, just to give you a colorful example. So, uh, variable lifetimes.cpp. So, all right, let's let's do exactly this. Uh, I want to make first of all, I'm going to make a a function called, I don't know, Goblet of Fire. That is the book in which all this stuff takes place. Uh, no parameters, returns nothing, but it has a local variable named Cedric. And then we'll have Harry out here. So, uh, and then main will call Goblet of Fire. Okay, so Harry is what's known as a global variable. He lives for the life of the program. Okay, he's defined outside of any uh, of any function, and so he just is chilling and he lives for the life of the entire program. Whereas Cedric. He lives inside of the goblet of fire function. He's a local variable. And uh, I guess I'm going to need to do this. Just like any other local variable, could be in main, could be in any other function. Uh, he lives only for the life of this function. OK? So for example, uh, I can print out Harry wherever I want. This is Harry in main. Oops. And uh, here's Harry in uh, Goblet of Fire. I can touch Harry. I can be like Harry plus plus. No, no worries. He's a he's a global variable. No, no issue. Uh, I can print out Cedric inside of Goblet of Fire. But the issue is, right here, before Goblet of Fire returns, Cedric, Cedric's memory goes away. We say it gets deallocated. So Cedric dies, sorry uh, for the spoiler. But Harry lives forever. He lived during Goblet of Fire, he'll live after. No problem. We can we can touch Harry down here. Harry plus plus. No worries. Uh, so that is essentially the difference between a local variable and a global variable. One just lives outside of the program. And so now let me show you this working. And I'm going to draw the stack. Oops. Uh, I'm going to draw that stack. Our lifetimes. Okay, so why in the world do we get any of this output? Let me break it down. Let's remember this program. Uh, here's what I want to do. I'm going to make a new slide, and we're going to walk through this 
in order. I'm going to keep on switching back and forth. Okay, so the very first thing that happens is here's our stack. And then in the global variables, they, they live somewhere else. I'll call it globals. Okay, so when our program starts, like the terminal or somebody calls main. Okay, does main have any local variables? It does not. So no boxes inside of there. But main, uh, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. And then when the program starts out as well, it makes all the local variables. So we have Harry, and he holds 43, right as the program starts. Okay, that's an A. Uh, so, we're on this line. Harry and Main, we print out 43. Boop. And then we call gobble, Goblet of Fire. And a function call means that we push. That's the weird lingo. You push on the stack, you pop off. Push on. And you pop off. Don't ask me why. That's just how it is. Uh, so main calls goblet of fire. That's the name of the function. Does it have any local variables? Yes, it does. It has Cedric. Remember? Here it is right there. Cedric gets 42. So it's as if in the program, we're in two different places at once. Oops. Main's waiting here still. Okay? Main's waiting for Goblet of Fire to finish. And we're sitting in Goblet of Fire right now, executing all of its lines. So here is the line that we just completed. We just set Cedric to 42. We made space and memory for him. There he is. And then the next line is Harry++. Plus plus. So we make Harry 44. And notice that we're remembering to come back to main because it's on the bottom of us. Okay, we're inside of Goblet of Fire executing all the lines there, but main is waiting for Goblet of Fire to return. So we just mean Harry 44, and so we're going to print out Harry in Goblet of Fire, he's 44. Cedric in Goblet of Fire, he's 42. Uh, we can even increment Cedric if we wanted to, that's not a problem. Uh, we'll print him out. And then finally, we return. We return from Goblet of Fire which means that this stack frame goes away and really it gets deleted okay and so I'm gonna just copy all of this just to prove it to you uh, we'll do this on multiple slides no no I wanna copy you and paste you right there please there we go so I'm really gonna erase now we're back from main or we're back from God of, Goblet of Fire in main and notice we have no more Cedric anymore he has he has died poor Cedric Harry's still chilling. He's 44 right now. We can access him. We can't say something like see out Cedric down here. He's gone. He's not part of this function. He's not a global variable. Okay? It's like, hey, what are you talking about? Undeclared. Now we can say Harry plus plus 45. And uh, finally, we can print out Harry one more time. Harry and main after Goblet of Fire. Okay? So, we called Goblet of Fire, it was waiting, Goblet of Fire finished, came back, and then we did the rest of our work in main. All right, Harry in main after Goblet of Fire, we print 45. So, hopefully, going, going slow like that helped uh, get it in your mind what's going on. The function call stack is a great thing to draw if you're ever wondering why something's going the way it is, okay? And that uh, C++ tutor website will be really helpful here because it, it draws a form of this. Okay, it looks a little different, and I prefer the way that I draw it, but uh, it will definitely help you to look at its uh, version of that. Okay, so uh, now it's time to move on to this thing called references, and they kind of go hand in hand with functions. So if I have a function, and I pass it a value, notice uh, that it gets a different copy of it, uh, and I'll, I'll show you an example of that. I want to be able to return multiple values at once. So let me show you the problem, and we'll talk about the solution. Uh, so maybe I have this function called foo. I don't know. See out x. Or you know what? Even better. x equals x plus 1. 
And then here's another x. Foo of x. All right. So this is colon foo of x. And I'm going to print x after this. Question for you: What does get what gets printed right here? Tell me. Dun dun dun. Oh, sorry. This is supposed to return an int. Uh, now we're not using it. Let's just say void. So what's getting printed right there? Take your guesses. I think a valid guess would be 42. A valid guess would be 43. Uh, those are your two options. There's a number there that's x. There's a number there that's x get, getting plus one. Maybe it's undefined. Maybe it's a compiler error. Who knows? But it looks like I have an x. It's just a parameter. All right. So oh man, is it 42? This x, after I called foo, it never got changed. Even though I said x equals x plus 1 up here. Why is that? And I think uh, I've explained enough to, to tell you why, uh, but I just want to drive it home in your mind, because this is something that might trick you. Uh, this is called x, but it's a completely separate place from this x. OK? So this is what's going on. Here's my main. And once I draw this, it'll be very apparent. There's my x. And then when I call foo with x, oops, it sets this x equal to whatever I give along. So it's x. What's x but 42? It sets this x to be 42. And it's a different x. OK? So there's two separate x's right now that are 42. So there's this x and this x. And by saying x plus plus up here, this x is 43, but I never print it out. And it returns, and then we print out this 42. OK? That's a problem. It would be nice if we could modify this, uh, this x down here and not make a copy up here. So it's getting copied. x got copied. Uh, alternatively, it would be nice if I can return multiple values at once. Right now, I'm kind of stuck. Like, I can say int foo double foo, string foo, I can return one thing, one kind of thing. That's kind of silly. Why can't I return two things? And there's a way to do that with this thing called references as well. So a reference is what's called an alias for a variable. It takes up no memory of its own. So it just is a different name for, for a place that is already there. So just another name. for an existing variable. That's what alias means. It's like a secret spy. It has a, has a code name. But it's still the same person. OK. And the way that you make a reference is you use an ampersand in the type. So you say that it's a reference to an int. It's a reference to a double. And you use this ampersand to signify the fact that it's this thing called a reference. And this is very important, the fact that it's in a type and not somewhere else. Uh, the ampersand, unfortunately, in C++ has multiple meanings. And so this one that I'm about to show you uh, means reference when it's only in a type. So here is how you use it. Here's my int x equals 42. And I can say int ampersand x, no, oh, sorry, int ampersand y equals x. OK, and I think in the, in the next slide, I got these backwards, so I'm just going to quickly swap them uh, dun, dun, dun. into y equals 42 and x equals y. Sorry. Same difference. OK, so that's how you use it. You say that x is a reference to an int. You kind of read it backwards. a reference to an int. Well, let's talk about what that means after I learn how to spell. So you can declare it in many different ways. You can put the ampersand wherever you want. It, C++ doesn't care about the white space around the ampersand. All right? It's just, I'm going to use it this way, because I think it's more uh, apparent that this is one big type. Okay, uh, But you can use it any way you want. 
And I think this is actually probably more common. So this is just saying that x is a reference to an integer, and it's an alias for y. All right. So let me let me type that out. X. Oh, I would like to please be wider. X is a reference to an integer, and it's uh, I guess we'll say to the integer y. That's how we can read it. Okay. And so what's going on in memory is the following. We had, maybe up here we had int y equal 42. And so we have y sitting here. And when we say this, or this, or this, those three lines are equivalent, we suddenly, we don't get another box. We don't get an x42. What we get is this. x is an alias for y. It's just another name for the same place. So we get this. You see that? So now I can suddenly say x or y and get the same place. I can say x plus plus, that'll make it 43. And then I can say y plus plus right after that, and it'll make that same box 44. I can print out either x or y, they'll be the same thing, because they reference the same place in memory. And I just said that word, and that's exactly why it, they call it this. They reference the same place in memory. OK, uh, let's see here. I guess I want to give you multiple examples now. So this is foo the silly way. Uh, let, let's use foo with references. And maybe the reason why, I, I should explain this, the reason why this is going to work, I'm about to put an ampersand here, uh, and it's going to work just fine. The reason why this works is the way that uh, parameters are passed to functions. It's kind of like for a split second in between these two function calls, in between main and foo before that happens, it's as if it does somewhere like out here, x equals x, like mains, mains x equals foo's x, and it says, it like declares it, int x equals the other x, int foo's x, oops, equals mains x. So that's kind of what's happening. All right, so, so there's some like in-between space between this function call and its body where the parameters are passed along and they're, they're set, if that makes any sense at all. And this is why, in essence, before this function starts and executes its body, if I put this as a reference, it's saying that int reference x, uh, this is foos again, is equal to mains x. And so it's setting up this x to be a reference to this x right here. So don't worry if that made no sense at all, but that's essentially what happens. There's like a, an interfunction place where uh, these, these parameters are getting instantiated with the arguments. So uh, if that made no sense at all, just don't worry. Uh, but this is why this is about to work. So I can say, uh, this won't work. No. I guess, honestly, let me just copy this, and let's do it this way, with references, and then we'll, I'll put it again, okay? So the reason this one's going to work, 43, is the following. When I call foo with references, uh, gosh, I don't have a space to do it now, do I? When I call foo with references, let's just pretend we we already tried the, the wrong thing. We already finished this foo call. We're like sitting right here about to call this function. So we're in main right now. And it's got its x still set to 42, of course, because that first foo didn't do it. And this is foo with references. But uh, for sake of example, I'm going to draw it with a different color. Everything that belongs to foo with references is going to be green. call it foo with refs. Does foo with references, references have any local variables? Well, every parameter is a local variable, so technically, but uh, this is a reference. It's not a normal int. It's not getting copied. This is an alias for something else. It's an alias for what we pass along here as its argument. So it's this x is equal to this x over here. And I'm using the same variable name just to make a point. So this foo 
can say x, and it's not a separate place up here that is a copy. It is the same place down here. So I can say foo. Uh, inside of this function, I can say x and get this place. All right. Uh, to, to make it slightly easier to, to manage, I can call this y. I can call all of these y. And it's the same thing. All right. I was trying to confuse you for a second. All right. So uh, let's pretend it's, its parameter's name is y now, just to clear things up for us. So foo does not have a y. That is a separate box of memory. It's an alias. This y is an alias for mains x. So up here in foo, we can say y equals y plus 1. And we are touching this x right here. Isn't that nice? So that's the idea. That's the reason why references work. You can give another name to a variable inside of a function that is not your own, which is super cool. Uh, and then the last example is returning multiple values at once is as easy as making a few variables down here. I want to return multiple variables. So I'll make them in main and then pass them as references. So I'll be like int a, b, undefined, and then I'll be I'll call like set a and b, and uh, I'll pass along a and b, and this will be a function that takes references, doesn't return anything in the return type, but it returns them in the parameters. So this is uh, int reference x, int reference y, and then I'll say x equals 42, y equals 43. And so when I call this, a becomes x, or x, sorry, the other way around, x becomes a reference to a, and then y becomes a reference to b, because that's the thing in the second uh, the second place for this function call. And then suddenly, when I, when I output these, because I pass them as references, uh, it actually gave them this memory space, I can output x and y. And they will be set to 42 and 43. No, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> They're a and b down here. Okie dokie. Uh, oh no. And then we can go and run this. And we got 42 and 43. So the references are super nice. They allow us to pass along variables that don't belong to us from another function. That we can touch. Touch and modify. Isn't that cool? And so uh, let's let's talk a bit more about how functions get called. Let's let's talk about that interfunction dreamland now. Let's explain it in full. So uh, what happens on the stack when we pass something to a function? So uh, hmm, let me call this arguments passing. Uh, maybe just arguments.cpp. So here is. I don't know, two functions, void foo int x, I don't know what it does, I don't know. we can do x plus plus again, and this can be bar int reference x, so we can say first foo of, we'll call it y in here, Dun dun dun. Foo of y, and then uh, we'll call bar of y as well. All right. So this is essentially the same as this one, uh, but I'm going to spell out to you exactly what happens in this interfunction dreamland. 
All right, so the second we call foo of y, we need to somehow give this y and put it into this x. And so in essence, there is a place in between the function calls where we do the following. There's like another line out here, and maybe it's right here. We say that r int x, and we set it equal to, uh, I don't know. We say that x is equal to uh, the y that we just passed along. That's where it goes, OK? That's the idea. And so then suddenly when we're in here, our x is going to be set to the y from, from main. And we copied it because this is an int x, and it's just a new place in memory. It's as if we declared it brand new, all right? So this is the interfunction dreamland. That's exactly what happens here, all right? And then here, again, we have our interfunction dreamland where we do int reference x. We initialize all of our parameters to the arguments that got passed at, uh, in, in those places. So we say bar of y. OK, so what happens before this function ca gets called is that we define, uh, we declare and initialize this int reference. Say int x, uh, int reference x equals mains y. OK. So this is exactly what happens in the interfunction dreamland, and that's why we have an int reference that is the same as this y in memory. And we can touch it uh, and modify it. OK? So uh, interfunction dreamland looks like that. And so this is why we can modify mains y. And this is why we can't, uh, or this is why we get a copy of mains y in x. It's because it's a brand new place. Whereas a reference, is not, that's not the case anymore, right? It's just an alias for something that already exists. OK, I hope that makes some sense. Uh, this made this pretty, that's fun. Uh, and then you can see again, see out y. It didn't change it because it got copied. See how why it did change it because it was passed by reference. All right, so oh, I should probably call it that. And so we have 42 the first time it didn't change, then 43 the second time because it did change. OK, so I hope that that is making more sense the more examples that I give. And this is uh, this first one is called call by value. OK, when you pass and it gets copied, this is call by value. We passed an argument and it got copied into our x local variable. And this one is called call by reference. We passed an argument and the alias, the, the reference variable, was instantiated to that. It's still a local variable, but it's a reference variable. And so, just like any other reference, this modifies an existing place in memory. All right. So I hope that makes sense. Please study this. It's a weird concept to get the first time, I know. Uh, we will give many more, many more examples, don't you worry. Uh, but that is a, a good and complete one. So uh, references, they make it so that you can save memory as well, because notice that when I'm passing along this x right here, it's not getting copied anymore. So it saves memory, especially if you're going to pass along a lot of arguments. when you have many args to pass. And uh, saving memory and not copying things actually translates to time as well, like it's faster for your function to run. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit today, but that's more of a CSI 41 topic. Uh, at least in these slides, we'll talk about it, probably not today. So I think. One of the last few things in this uh, in this lecture I want to talk about is multiple files. Uh, 
So we have been making a lot of functions. We've been splitting things up, which is super nice, and it, it makes our program so much easier to read. Uh, but our files, they just have a bunch of, we have, they have a ton of things in them now. So you can imagine, I'm making a bunch of little functions and calling them all in main, and or maybe they call each other, who knows. But then our, our .cpp file, it, gets, it still gets huge. It's just not everything is in main now. We have a different problem. So there is a way to split up our programs into multiple .cpp files, okay? And also into some files called .h. So let's talk about those. All right, this is, this is how we can make our own libraries, guys. This is really cool. So uh, the first thing, the first piece of the puzzle is your library uh, has its declaration somewhere. This is, this is what the user sees, all right? It's what the user needs to know to use your library. And I have taught you how to use libraries, and you, you'll remember that the documentation pages only have this. They don't tell you how the function's implemented, because you don't care as long as it does what you expect. You just need to know how to call it, what types you need to give, and what type it returns back. Okay. That's nice. And uh, the place that that stuff goes is in a .h file. You can also use .hpp or .hxx, whatever. I'm going to use .h. Uh, and then you implement these things into a inside of a file that the user never sees called foo.cpp, all right? It has, it's the, uh, it's the pair that goes along with foo.h, okay? And uh, you can, of course, use other things, .cc, .capital C, .cxx. There, there are multiple things, but I use .cpp in my class. And this is the implementation of your library that the user doesn't need to see. Impl. Implementation of lib lib for library. All right, and uh, we'll talk about this include in a second. And then finally, you can go and use your library in some other file with the main function. All right, this is where you l use your library. And so this makes for a very nice logical separation between declarations, implementations, and uses. Okay, and uh, in order to get access to your things, you include your file just like a library. So uh, the only difference is you use the single quotes for your files. The, uh, these little angle brackets are just for system libraries only. Okay, and so I'm going to show you what this number sign include actually means in just a second. Uh, and then finally, once you've made a bunch of these files, you actually only ever need to say, uh, you give them all to G++ in a row, but you only ever give the implementation files to G++. Okay? So uh, what I'd like to do is go back to last lecture and convert our sum of squares functionality into a library. Okay? So let's do this. I'm going to edit a new file. Uh, oh gosh, let's get out of Vim for a second. Uh, here's what I want to do. I want to make a folder inside of this uh, inside of this lecture 12 folder. Uh, sum of squares lib, for example. Uh, or I'll just make a folder called sum of squares, and I'll go inside of that. OK, now I'm there. I'm going to copy the one file that had sum of squares from last, uh, last lecture. This is lecture 11, uh, sum of squares dot cpp. And uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy it into this folder. And so I've just got this one file now. I'm going to split it up like I was saying over here. Implementation, uh, declarations, and uses. All right. So the first thing, let's get, the, let's get rid of the main function. I'll put it in a file called main.cpp. Oops. Main.cpp. Here it is. Uh, and no, I guess I don't want any of that, do I? I'm going to copy it all in. So here is that can go here, this can go here. So this is what's going on right now. I just made a main.cpp file, and I have some of squares.cpp as well. So here's that, and uh, 
don't worry about this for now. I'm going to then make my header file with the implementation, or sorry, the declarations of all of my functions. I'm going to say square, sum of squares, those are the declarations. I'm going to put, I'm going to put those in a sum of squares dot h file. Save that. Uh, then I'm going to go and include that in my implementation file and my main.cpp. All right, and I'm going to go and save absolutely everything. OK, so, oop. so now I have three files. I've got main.cpp, which has my use, my main function. I'm using my sum of squares function. Then I have sum of squares h, which is my library's declarations. And then I have my implementation of everything, sum of squares and square. OK, let's go through this slowly. So this is a .h file. It contains only implementation or only declarations of our library functions. All right. That's beautiful. Uh, and this, this is our implementation file for our library. It's sum of squares.cpp. And then we have main.cpp down here. And this has our use. This file includes our library and uses it. OK. Hopefully that makes enough sense. And we can compile it using only the implementation files. And then I'll talk about what this pound include sign means. So this is how you're going to compile this. Compile, compile, compile with G++, standard equals C++ 17 as usual. Then you give both CPP files. I've made two, see, some squares and main. Dash O, we can call it main perhaps. So this is exactly what you're going to say when you want to go and compile this. All right. Now, I'm going to go and do it. Uh, but I'm in the wrong folder, sorry. Let's go inside of sum of squares, compile. So it took both of those files, put them together, and made one big file, one big executable file called main. And I can now run and do exactly what I was doing before. So I just split up my big, large program into multiple bite-sized files, which is super nice. And uh, now let me talk about what this pound and include sign means. So uh, maybe I'll put it right here. When I say include sum of squares at each, you, you can also, I mean, this, this is what happens when you include IO stream as well. It's just a file somewhere. It copies and pastes the entirety of this file into your current file. That's all it does. Isn't that silly? But it's very useful. So uh, it was technically not necessary for me to put it right here because uh, square was defined before sum of squares here. But if I put this below, and I didn't have that, it would be like, dude, what are you talking about? I don't know what square is. See? Undeclared. This, though, saves me from that because it defines both. It's like, yeah, there's a function called square. Whereas here, it's like, uh, you're trying to call this square, dude, but I've, I haven't seen it up here. What are you talking about? But this include right here takes care of that because it's going to copy and paste the declarations to quell C++'s fears of, hey, this function is not defined. We'll just say, yes, I'm declaring it. It will exist. It's just going to be down here. OK. And so it's happy because it sees square because this got copied and pasted. OK. 
I know this is all weird, but you'll get used to it, I promise. So, uh, I think that's almost all I want to say here. Uh, the next thing is there are some fancy things that you can put inside of your header files. This if end if, usually the name of the, f the, the file in all caps and then an underscore instead of a dot and then an h, uh, and then an end if at the, at the very end. Uh, what this does is it keeps you from performing infinite inclusion <laughs> because it's possible to do the following. It's kind of silly. Uh, there are ways to actually do this, though, uh, that aren't as silly. So, uh, here. How do I want to do this? Let's say, I don't know. Uh, let's include ourselves. Hee hee hee. Alright, so this is sum of squares at h. Inside of sum of squares dot h, I will include sum of squares dot h. So, once it sees this line, it's going to copy and paste this whole file, boop, and I'll replace that with the whole file. No, oh, oops. Copy and paste it. Replace it with the whole file. Oops. 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 Oh, I've got to include it again, 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 again. So that's infinite inclusion. And let's let's look at the fun error that it, that occurs when this happens. Wee. So. It just kept trying to include it, and eventually it didn't have enough room in the compiler to remember. But it's like, oh, included from this file, oh, also included from the same file, included from the same file. That is infinite inclusion for you. It's just copying and pasting the whole thing, and it's very dumb, so it, it includes the include again. So we can actually solve this problem. This is a stupid thing to do, uh, but it does happen in practice sometimes across files. So you can make a compile time variable. That's what this is. So it's saying make a special compile time variable to keep track of whether or not this header file has already been included. So we'll say, we'll guard against it. We say, if you haven't seen this thing, if in diff, if it hasn't been defined, sum of squares, and you can, you can give anything here. It's com commonly the name of the file. If it hasn't been defined before, define it to just be nothing. You can say, define it to be one. Who cares? We'll just define it. The fact that it exists will solve this problem. This is end if. This is like one big if statement at the compiler level. And this will solve our problem because the second we include this once, this has been defined. So it will not, even though it copies and pastes itself, it will not execute this compile time if statement anymore. So this is, this is fancy. Uh, this is probably one of those few things I'm going to ask you to memorize, but uh, it's really helpful to include these three lines, that one and those two and this one. It keeps you from infinitely, inc infinitely including yourself. Okay? So uh, super useful. And uh, constant parameters, I think, is something we'll save for the next lecture. That was that was enough for today. That was enough to let sink in. Okay, so we've come very far. This is a long set of slides about functions, but there's a lot to functions. We learned how to make our own, how to test them, how they get executed, how to pass along things and actually update them, uh, update the original values, and now how to make large programs and have them exist across multiple implementation files and header files, and how to guard against this infinite inclusion thing. So uh, we've come very far, and uh, that's, that's where I want to leave us for right now. So uh, good luck on your midterm. None of this will be on it right now. Uh, I will have a, depending on the order in which you watch this, I will have a uh, review video out soon as well. So uh, there is that. Look forward to it, and I will see you later.